Hello and welcome to YouTube's favorite comics channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Want to remind everybody, we have a Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon up and running now. Different levels will get you access to our videos early. King Kayfaber level will get you access to all of the videos early. Beat that Kayfabe effect and sit in on the recording session like a bunch of King Kayfabers are doing right now. We are also working cartoonist. You see our bibliographies on the screen in front of you. Best way to support the channel is to buy our books, and we got some big ones coming out this year. Ed Piscor putting out the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus later this year. You can pre-order that one now. It collects all of the Hip Hop Family Tree comics in one very handsome volume, complete with gold foil. That's what you see, this little yellow effect in the printout here. It is going to shine whenever it's actually in your hands. 140 extra pages. You can pre-order that one now at a bit of a discount. So uh, pick that up or let your store know you want a copy. Red Room Crypto Killers, the third and final season of Red Room, is starting up with within two months. It should be hitting stands, so let your local comic shop know that you want to put that in your subscription box. This is your standard cover. If you're watching this video when it comes out on Sunday, final order cutoff is tomorrow, Monday. Uh, so get get your uh, get your orders in. And some cool variants. You see here the sketch cover. You guys have been begging for that. Ed Piscor doing a variant cover. Peach Momoko doing a variant cover. And me paying homage to Rob Liefeld's Youngblood with my variant cover. So... Let your store know you need that copy immediately because if you want to reserve issue one, you got to do that real fast. You can also reserve Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. This is my next Street Angel book coming out from Image Comics later this spring, collecting all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Deadliest Girl Alive. Pre-order that one today so you will not miss out and so they know how many of those to print. You can also pick up our other books. X-Men, Grand Design, three volumes in an omnibus, Hip Hop Family Tree and Treasury Size Editions. See that art up close and big. WYSIWYG and two previous seasons of Red Room as well as Hulk Grand Design, Plain Janes, Street Angel Deadly Girl Alive from me, all available right now. All right, Ed, let's dive into this. It's been a while since we've looked at a Wizard magazine. It's uh, the foundation of cartoonist kayfabe in a lot of ways. And we are up to issue number 52, December 1995, I am completely checked out of Wizard Magazine at that point. This issue is all new for me, and uh, X-Files gracing the cover. I'll tell you where I would see X-Files around this time. I didn't have Wizard subscription anymore. I had Entertainment Weekly, and X-Files, of course, a huge sensation on television. Got to do the comics adaptation, and I do remember it being successful. Charles Adlard, yeah. the longtime artist, did, I don't know, the basically the full run of X-Files, pretty good looking book as a result everybody watching this probably knows him from walking dead but had a big run on a very hot cultish comic in the uh, 90s here with x-files this is a virgin virgin issue to me as well uh it flew off the freaking stands man i i would i uh, had no subscription to wizard but i would easily buy it monthly you could find it yeah. anywhere uh there are subscription. There, there are print numbers. Circulation numbers are in this issue. So they were putting out four hundred and fifty thousand plus issue copies of an issue of Wizard at that time. For the whole, not month, hard to find usually. Yeah, for the whole month of November of ninety five, uh, when this would have been on on the stands, I I never saw it. Never was able to uh, to scoop it up. It speaks to what X Files was. You know, it was kind of a phenomenon pretty early on, and in the crossover with comics audience. You know, like it's that Venn diagram of like this is the right stuff for like. You know, like, th this is the perfect synergy. If you were trying to do what all those Valiant uh, bean counters would try to do, X-Files and comics is sort of a pretty good one. I'll tell you this, man. This issue is the sort of I indicator of where Wizard goes. You know, it's the first real kind of photo-ish cover. It's a painting. I, I hate this cover. The It's the it's the this emaciated, whitish paint job on the... It, it, it looks like... Night of the Living Dead zombies as uh, Mulder and Scully. There's something anemic and washed out about it that just feels... Do you think that this is like they're pasting up photos and then, you know, adding painted elements? Is that how this is put I, together? Yeah, I have no idea about that stuff. But the article is nothing about the comic. And we could probably skip over it uh, because it's really about the TV show. And uh, just, just uh, coincidentally, I've been uh, watching X-Files... And uh, from the start, and, you know, we call it the golden age of television now. And it just, it reminds you what TV was like back then, because it was just like, you know, the, the major comics of that time were like, the characters are the same at the beginning, at the end of each episode. And by episode three, when Scully is seeing 
people spontaneously combust and seeing pens float in the air and write, you know, so-and-so killed me. When you watch the next episode and she's skeptical about anything, <laughs> it just kind of loses everything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the ultimate skeptic there. Yeah. Like, it's, it's like there's, a, there's a point where you have to, you don't got to denounce science, but you got to kind of accept things at certain points. Hey, it's really interesting that you say this is where Wizard goes, because I'm sure they were tracking this. And I, I want to, I actually almost pulled out future issues to see, because I think once a year they run those numbers. Mm. And I'm curious about various numbers at this time and how they compare to comics because I have this theory as comics plummet wizard continues to sell pretty well definitely but they would have noticed if this issue sold out you know if this really was a hot issue they would know that right right away and potentially curve their magazine that direction like why was this the hit issue out of you know the last year let's do more of this and it probably is like the media tie-in stuff yeah Garib with his stuff (laughs) like he's an entrepreneur if anything you know like comics is just a means absolutely and boy, Rob is still buying some big advertising pages in these issues. And Rob Liefeld, Stephen Platt, Mike Diodato Jr. is your names on this kind of crossover. He was talking about, in some chats with us, about how J. Scott Campbell influenced the Jim Lee style. Stephen Platt influenced Rob Liefeld's style, whether he admits it or not. And it would be certainly the hair. Mm-hmm. Like, he did not draw profit hair that way until Stephen Platt uh, introduced that. But these little ticks these are almost like it's like drawn ink spatter you know it's not a flickety flick it's a conscious like i'm gonna hit dabs just because that comes from uh platt look at how much coloring is going on her skin there's not a not a line on her skin all of that is uh give it to the colorist colors making money man i wonder if it's dokiko taganashi yeah i don't see the uh don't see the signature there all right, so... Doesn't Del Kion look like Macaulay Culkin? <laughs> he does. It's a funny picture. All of that ni- 1995 fashion, like the kind of loose pants and stuff. And these are 1990s comic book stairs. <laughs> from, like, the image... The, the way the image guys draw stairs. Totally. Uh, not too much here in the editorial, just calling out X-Files and Del Kion, basically highlighting what's in here, the Halloween costume. One fascinating piece is, uh, now for my monthly shameless plug, check out our Wizard World Forum on America Online. So that gives you that little time capsule element to uh, this magazine. And uh, there will be Wizard magazines. I actually have some that I bought in the poly bags that I, that I ripped out like in semi-recent times. That have the one month free uh, yes. a- AOL uh, subscription those, yeah. gimmick. So, you know, we're, we're now entering, you know, co- when comics was crypto, there was the bubble burst. And now we are entering the, the dot com boom. You see it here with the Techno Comics ad, Techno Comics Online, mm. Windows 95. Amazing. You know, this is what the website looks like. Ooh, one more piece here. I guess I was wrong. This editorial is rich with content. <laughs> Next issue, December, will be the bad girls of comics. <laughs> It'd be nice to see that peak and maybe move on. Uh, Marvel DC starting their hot shotting. You yeah. know, this is a couple years past the uh, image exodus of talent. Marvel certainly not not doing its best work at this point, uh, sales wise. And now it's time to like, how do we sell this? And we're going to see a news item that's even bigger. But you can see already starting these crossovers. This letter is uh, interesting to me because this kind of stuff comes up. Uh, all the time when it comes to, you know, we lived through the baseball strike. I think we lived through, a, was there a hockey strike in our life, in the 90s? I think we've seen it all. I think there's been basketball, football, and hockey. And you have, basically, it's jealous work-a-day people, paycheck-to-paycheck people, who are like, fuck these greedy baseball players, fuck these greedy football players, uh, and their, and their, you know, what they receive as compensation for their craft. They don't deserve more. They're being greedy, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, this is a person, by the way, for anybody that's not reading the fine print, who has sided against the uh, creator ownership kind of people. Right. Let me read a sentence. The injustices of the... Wait. If a person creates a character in a work-for-hire situation, knowing full well that he retains no rights, then he has no reason to piss and moan about it. If you can't take the heat, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) And that's the tone of this whole thing, is complaining about these guys like the Frank Millers, like the image founders, basically go on and, you know, setting up their own 
work for higher shops and all they do is piss and moan and whine about it compares them to baseball players. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's NPC talk is what that kind of stuff is, but it comes up pretty, pretty often. And to see, because you and I know the economic realities of, of cartooning and being a cartoonist, uh, just even with the Rob Liefeld conversation that we had, uh, when he's talking about Bob Harris, getting people out of the game, people were mentioning names, her Trippy, this person, Marie Severin, they got, they got, put out or something with no compensation for retirement, any of that kind of thing. Um, and it's like, well, they're not employees of Marvel. Like it's, it's very clear, you know, you're in business for yourself, but if you're going to be in business for yourself, like be in business for yourself. And like Frank Miller talking about creator rights was extremely valuable. Uh, if not for his generation, for ours, you know what I mean? So this kind of NPC talk is worth uh, acknowledging that it exists because it still exists to this day, but that's literally all it is. It's very heated. Like, this guy seems passionate about this idea. It's all it is. It's, a, it's, it's the guy who has that grease spot imprint in his couch who can't believe that dudes can sit there and make comics and do their life's passion and make, some, make a living at it. And maybe they want some more equity and more opportunity, and he, he will take a very long-winded way of saying that that's nonsense, just like the baseball people, just like the football people. Uh, never talking about the owners who are making crazy amounts uh, yeah. on on everything. All slut or all art? This is promo for next issue's bad girl issue. <laughs> I wonder if they, uh, if they carefully, if they coordinate that. I would assume in hindsight, like everything's a work. You know, they have to be like, hey, uh, McLaughlin or whoever's selecting letters, we're doing bad girls next next month. Yeah. Well, save some of those letters and let's put it, let's build it to that. Yeah, and, and uh, let's build all, some heat. All publicity is good publicity, man. When when promos come down on us for this or that, uh, that issue of Red Room sells out right. uh, more than any other, but except the first issue one. I so. found this odd. Just the uh, cast of characters that are making the envelope art. Space Ghost, Too Much Coffee Man, Earthworm, Jim, and Spectre. Like, we're in a strange state. You know, before this, we would see spawns and ghost riders and stuff. At this point, it feels like this really is where we're at in the mid-90s in terms of, like, it's chaotic. There isn't, like, some hot book or, you know, hot something. Okay, so this is the perfect point because, like, I am all in on comics during this time period. And in 1995... The Anti-Gravity Room television show is on Sci-Fi Channel. That is when Adelphia Cable here in, in, in Pittsburgh like opened up. And now you have 50 channels instead of like 30. And every Saturday, there was a fucking show devoted to comic books. There are no less than two episodes with Doug Tenable, or however you say his name, talking Earthworm Jim and future video game ideas and stuff. Because, like, of course, they would buttress the comic stuff with what's happening in video games and, and, and trading cards like magic and stuff. Well, tell me this. Yeah. Is he doing comics then? Is Earthworm Jim a comic then? No. I don't, it, it's weird that it's, you know, like, why it, was he even on that channel? Because there are tons of video games. I, I was, I was, I was so deep, right? Earthworm Jim was, it was like, it was a, it was a force. And, and like the superhero part of it spoke to kids who dug super, like the kids who liked Image Comics, like liked Earthworm Jim. I don't know how to explain it. Like they it maybe publicized it, pushed it in that sort yeah. of way where like maybe the original ads were in Wizards or something, but it was woven. There yeah. was no comic to support it or anything like that. But there was also no less than two, maybe three episodes with, with full Shannon Wheeler excerpt conversations you right. know like like portions of the show devoted to shannon wheeler and his his thoughts and things so like it's 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 that period for yeah. sure it's how about jim lee with the uh super nintendo wildcats spawn uh super nintendo game there was the jim lee wildcats cartoon spawn cartoon max we looked at those rob liefeld issues of uh new mutants the back cover was a jim lee art on a Punisher video game ad. Yeah. Jim Lee was connected to video game stuff really early on. I think those Punisher ads and like his promo art connected to video games was a big thing like, throughout his career. His, that same art, I believe, was on the cabinet of the arcade machine, you know, that would have been in mm -hmm. arcades and stuff. I think it was a big thing. Like when he's at Wild Storm, like he's doing a bunch of licensed video game stuff that seemed to be ahead of any other comics output. So here we go. Battle of the Century. Big announcement. <laughs> they they bring out <laughs> Mark Greenwald and uh, who's the DC rep? To, Mike Carlin. To, 
Planet Hollywood to like announce this and talk about it. People in cosplay. Look at how middle of the road that is. I mean, this is a full on jobber special. Look, is this reporter picking her nose? It does look like it. <laughs> or maybe she's ponderous. That's that might be it. Uh, you got your Jurgens, your Peter David, your Rubenstein, your Paul Neary. I, I have the first issue. It's as boring as this image. There's yeah. nothing dynamic. It's very left and right. It's uh, very like, let's give everybody full space. So there's no real depth because there's nothing overlapping. Uh, you have to suck balls of DC and Marvel in equal measure. So like the characters have to be the same sizes. Uh, it's a full on compromise designed to make money. I got the first issue certainly out of a quarter bin in some of my recent times. And that could be something we can look at because I have no problem making money for ourselves off of uh, such hack work. Off the battle of the century. Yeah. It's it's uh, neat to see this stuff because I look at it and it's like, man, they should have got like a fight. Somebody does fight posters to design this, right? Thinking right. through today's lens. But you look at this and it's still in that candy colored... Like, we've got the digital tools now, but we have not developed them to a point of any kind of nuance. It is just the most brightly saturated. Looks like it's aimed at eight-year-olds. It's flat backgrounds. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a pile of horseshit. Of course. Total compromise. It looks very anachronistic, and you would think, like, these are the two cutting-edge comics. They're the leaders. They don't look like it. I would say we do this Todd piece and then go to page 196 and, and just have, like, one conversation about the Todd... Yeah. Spawn comic on a current affair. You want to do that now or at the end? Let's 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 do that now, man, okay. and just get that out of the way. All right. So Spawn on a Current Affair, fair treatment. And what happened is Spawn Thirty features the KKK. Yeah. And and, uh, and, it's, and it's Spawn hanging uh, on on the cover. Yes. Yeah. Get some attention. Get some attention on national syndicated television show. And and tomorrow, let's look at let's look at that video. Let's look at that comic. Sounds good. We'll we'll post that Monday. So he's kind of talking about his experience on there and how, uh, you know, it's pretty one-sided what they cut out of his conversation. I, I, I saw it in real time, like just just totally casually. It was not something that was promoted and like, you know, the, we had 30 channels. Uh, and I saw it and uh, it was, you know, there was a little old grandma, black lady, who sees his comic in her grandson's stack and looks at it and it's like, what the, what the fuck is this? Uh, we can, we can, you know, just skip to the back. He gets a little bit deeper and talks about, you know, you know, ne they never talk about the good stuff in comics. Comics is very popular now. So you could uh, jump at <clears throat> things and cut promos. Uh, my thoughts, I actually think that it was a complete work. I, I don't think that, that some grandma, I think, Todd manipulated the media and got publicity for Spawn in that way because he is that smart and that savvy. When he goes on Howard Stern and he talks about the whole point, everybody's talking about what kind of boob he is for buying Sammy Sosa baseball and Mark McGuire baseball. Yo, save your money, like blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And then he uses that opportunity to get all that publicity. Everybody knows who Todd McFarlane is at that moment. It, it's a... Uh, it's a uh, Hail Mary pass to get sports licenses away from the starting lineup figures. And, yes. it, and it works. He is what my granny would say, dumb as a fox. Yes. When it comes to this kind of stuff. And I think that he got, he found a way to get some promo on those magazine television shows that were very popular at the time, had big fucking ratings but you have to have you have to be able to it's like i said earlier man anybody who talks talks smack uh who who mentions your name they're po they're promoting you and it might hurt a little bit to like cuz you're human right and you're sure. like oh man somebody doesn't like me or a hundred people don't like me man they're retweeting a lot of stuff about how they dislike me why do the comics sell more than anything else uh on my my publisher, yours, whatever. Uh, and it's just because all publicity is good publicity. And I think he manipulated, uh, I think he made it happen. I'm going to say, I'm going to say that right here. I would love to talk to him and just ask him that flat out. Did you make the current affair thing happen with, with this power of hindsight that we have uh, with 
the remove, you know, the statutes of limitations is up, Uncle Todd. You could you could be honest because he's able to manipulate Kickstarter. He's a he can do it all. He he understands media in a very savvy way. That's the other thing I took away from this. Time and time again, when we look at any kind of historical stuff, I'm usually surprised by, oh, this is the same story that's happening now. Right. And he's complaining about the way media really one sided this story and cut things a certain way. And it feels like, yeah, this is the same conversation that's been trending for certainly the last, you know, five, six, eight years. Uh, and it's happening here in 95 because that's the way all these stories go. And, he, and you know, he's that's never going to change. He's the heel in, in that in that episode. But it was the first time. So so I was done with Spawn Comics. Like when Todd was done, I was finished. But I ran out and got those comics uh, that couple of issues, because the one before that is the one where the little boys kill kill their mm-hmm. like uh, child abuse dad. Right. Good issue. Uh, but it, it got it got put on my radar again thanks to that current current affair thing. So so it was a commercial, and it's the ninety it's ninety five middle nineties extreme hardcore stuff is the trend. So to say that this comic is so hardcore, uh, and and to set it up that way. Sometimes the sales are people... It's ideological sales. Uh, that's what happens with a lot of Kickstarter and stuff now, where you have these people in political pools right. who have their work supported. And on both ends of the spectrum, you read the comic, dog shit. Dog shit comics. But people of the same ideological means support it to just make it happen. You can't get confused that like that support is means you're good. It means that they believe in your ideology. So, like, when he could have got a bunch of sales from people he wouldn't like, if you know what I'm saying. Like, oh, fuck that lady. I'm going to buy it anyway. I'm going to make this comic super popular. Also, it's a chance to put your comic in front of millions of, of uh, you know, an audience. It's a work. I'm telling you. That's really, uh, it's, it's real interesting. It makes me wonder what uh, issue 28 and 31 are, because these two issues are so almost intentionally provocative. Yeah. It makes me wonder if that's something that he was keying on at the time. And if so, did he do more of those kinds of like, ooh, what's another hot button issue? I feel like we would know it. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't think of them either. But I was out of Spawn at that time, you know? Like, this this is something that I've kind of come back to. Uh, G.I. Joe was at Dark Horse for a minute, and this is the announcement for that, where they were saying, like, they're going to go starting all over with a clean slate. Man, I remember that thing flopping hard. Trash. I uh, I do have the first issue. Bought it off the rack. I, bought, I did buy that new. Uh, it has that very provocative Frank Miller cover. Yes, Silhouette. Yeah. Flag. Soldier, b- b- bullet ridden uh, f- flag wrapped around him. Great image. Penciled by uh, Tatsuya Ishida, Godzilla uh, artist. Do you remember the art being yeah. interesting? No, it, it, like in my mind, it looks like New Men from Image Comics or something. That kind of like semi huh. uh, Maramanga ish kind of. I look. just remember, man, it was like. Phew, oh, it's trash. It did not, uh, did not get any traction. Marvel and Christie's teaming up for some auction of some stuff. Nothing stands out. It's kind of weird stuff like recreations of Captain America covers by Joe Simon. Very odd. But it's another one of those lines of like, we're pushing comics in every avenue we can. Um, You know, this doesn't happen by accident. There were people, probably Marvel high ups that saw an opportunity there. And I do think that that has sown dividends over time comics was crypto and everybody wanted a piece like i said there was a fucking half hour every week on sci-fi channel devoted to comics if that doesn't happen if shit ain't popular this is a story that i'd be curious to hear more about moondogs opens boutiques and music and video stores so they're in like fye which used to be around here maybe was all over the place i think they might have had thousands of stores you know as a chain of like record uh record stores and moondogs was a big chain in the midwest had maybe eight or ten stores. It was about as close as you got to, like, really something that could be national. They partner with this company, and they open up a bunch of these departments within the music stores that are going to sell comics, and they're going to be staffed by, like, Moondogs, you know, basically training and and employing these people. I don't remember encountering this. So I don't know that this had any success or how how big it actually went, but they talked about, like, in the future, maybe getting a negotiation with Sears for comics boutiques. It's just interesting because nobody's ever done like a national chain of comics retail in any way. And one of the biggest stores did make an attempt here. So I'm curious how that went. We Mary met, Martyr may have been around at this point. We met a lot of uh, retailers recently. And uh, their level of entrepreneurship 
varies. There's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a big spectrum. And we, we've we never had a kind of Steve Jobs-ish kind of mind work things in that space. Or if they did, it just, you get like a Steve Jeppy or something who, who controls the distribution or something, which is just like, you know, that's fine for him. But I like this idea of a retailer thinking outside the box and like making deals. It seems so savvy to to try and give it a shot. It's very weird that there haven't been attempts like this. There might have been just behind the scenes yeah. and we don't know about it. This seems like a big push. Like I say, if Larry Martyr was there, like that'd be a guy to, to maybe try to track down and, and get some info on it because it's just a unusual he, he bit was, of comics business. He, he was at Image, certainly, at this time. I don't was know. he there? Oh, definitely. I, I never know like the timeline of this stuff when you get back that far. It kind yeah. of blurs to me. Uh, any standouts in your company updates? I don't think so. Acme Novelty 6. Yeah, Fanographics. Uh, and here's the noteworthy piece. Acme Novelty Library 6 continues its quarterly pace. Uh, it's more than 32 pages. It's It could be double that uh, at times. But he's still maintaining a quarterly pace. And Del Keown, uh is maybe three times a year for 22 pages of penciled artwork. So that's like an interesting thing. That is funny because I think that's exactly the way that works out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Art and Pictures Museum, yes. Kevin Eastman's museum, celebrating its third anniversary. That's pretty cool. Biggest regret of my, my life, young life. You know, I used to get those catalogs too. Uh, the, the, the literature associated with uh, that museum. And I just could never figure a way... To give, convince my workaday parents, man, to uh, make the trip to New England to go uh, check that joint out. Black Hole issue number two coming out from Kitchen Sink Press, Charles Burns Black Hole. That's how I encountered Black Hole was mail order through Kitchen Sink. Yeah, I feel like the last issues came out when we were even homies. Man. Oh, yeah, like, we were. I remember picking it up with Mark Zingarelli was there the week that, that I picked it up, and he was shocked that I read Black Hole like it was a, so that, I don't know, adult book or that something. That could be 2002, 2003. Yeah, yeah it took a while. I mean, you know, 14 issues at that meticulous kind of nature, but... Was it 14? Wasn't it 14? I thought it was 10, but I'm not sure. Maybe it wasn't 14, but it, it was a lot. I feel like it was one issue per year. Yeah, that's about how I think, especially by the end, I think that's how, how it was going. There's a few CD-ROM or CD kind of things in here. You mentioned that AOL in the beginning. We're going to see, like, screensavers for image comics oh, near yeah. the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny, everybody trying trying this stuff. Yeah, but this is about bootleg bone imagery uh, on some British thing. You know, the the, the way the, the Beastie Boys made their first money was not from record sales, but it was from suing British Airways for s sampling their music without authorization. They found out about it. They were able to sue and settle uh, British Airways, and that's the way they got their first apartments. Had and, no and idea. All that. So, yeah, wow. yeah. Read Hip Hop Family Tree. <laughs> I, uh, I, I kind of love that statue. I feel like this arm isn't right, but whenever you have four arms, like probably some anatomy is going to be strange. And and like when we're talking balance and things, does this thing have to be? Oh, that looks like that looks like a mercury? ten pound plate. <laughs> yeah, because that is a lot. You of... could throw this on the end of your barbell and, and, and have so, a good man. workout. I think. I think so because that's a lot of weight leaning this way. So you have to counterbalance that. There's got to be some some heavy ass stuff in there. Love the face. I would like to. I'd be curious to see what that actually looks like in real life and how much they're doctoring that face for the you ad. You know, I bet it's dope. Like it Randy Bowen is. and those. It every, is. every one of those statues I ever saw was cool. I would. I, I just could never. The, the the kind of the kind of girlfriends I like to have would not respect they me. They wouldn't tolerate. If, <laughs> they wouldn't if tolerate I, a forearm man. Uh -uh, Fifteen uh -uh. inch sculpture. But I, under. But, I, but I do see that. I remember <laughs> when it was a big deal and like looking at them and like, oh, that's dope. Yeah. Like that thing. Was there were quite cool. a few of those. I never bought any, but there were quite a few that would roll through. Like there was a Savage Dragon one that I thought was really badass. Yeah, I know it. Uh, Jim Lee returning to draw a couple of Gen Thirteen issues. Oh, dude, it's so amazing. So Anti Gravity Room, they would do, uh, they would do reviews, and uh, the the main dude Nick reviewed the Jim Lee Gen 13 issues and hit, I must be that dude Nick's age, man, because it, <laughs> it was the same exact vibe. You love the spirit of Gen 13 and the, and the humor and the fun. And Jim Lee just fucking zaps all of that out and makes it a Wildcats comic with the Gen 13 character. You know, that, that very static kind Take of... Take the humor out of it. Totally. And like shrink the eyes up and, and all that kind of thing. And that is pitch perfect. That's exactly what Nick said. And that was the vibes. It was like... When is J. Scott Campbell coming back? Because, like, I like Jim Lee, but, like, this ain't this ain't for me. I don't remember this Valentino Extreme Studio pair-up, but I might have been out on all the image books by that point. All that I remember is him 
doing that Image X month uh, issue ten or you, or issue nine. You know what else? Like this has to be. When does Liefeld leave Image? But it's got to be soon. Because uh, Maximum Press is definitely out. Uh, Alan Moore is writing War Child comics. So Halloween Night. This is Jeff Loeb and Tim Sell. Before they had done their uh, Long Halloween stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is like uh, one-shots that they were doing each year. I think this is maybe the third one that they're doing from the uh, Legends of the Dark Knight Halloween specials. Tim Sale still tightening up. You know, yeah. like he grows into something that is not this right here. Uh, but this is a great kind of uh, starting point. I feel like this is used in Long Halloween, but maybe, yeah, that's I guess an amazing not, I guess image. Not. That's probably it's, it's, that's probably one of those images that like everybody gravitated towards, and then it was like you're going to reuse that, retool that, put that everywhere because that's such a striking. That's a really good uh, use of the Batman kind of image. Um, I like this two page spread of like let's showcase something. I wish right. image did. I wish Wizard did a little bit more of this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, Pretty like good feature. Like I said, we're 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 getting to the point in in Wizard where it is pushing starting going to start pushing more towards pop culture this is another one of those like two pages get in and out quick and it's the first look of kingdom come um i think i mentioned in a previous episode i picked up a collection of that recently it must have been an anniversary issue it has a bunch of back matter that's really cool i, I want to it's wanna, a matter of time before we look at that and maybe we'll do it before you go as a sunday break. that's a good sunday vid. um i want to show you yeah like uh, i want to show you what i have and see if it's the same material uh, yeah. in in the back because i have some good back matter in a hardcover they do a good job of Again, just a very short, this is what I want. Get in and out quick. Give me the lowdown and talk about how different this is from Marvel's. You know, if it weren't for Alex Ross, it's it's kind of a very different take on it because it's the old DC characters. Right. And this is a book I picked up at the time. And I picked up the first issue. And yeah. And I'm like, I'm oh, good. I know people that love it, but, you know, they compare it to Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns. And, hey, man, if you're trying to sell books, that's, that's pretty do. good, pretty smart marketing on your part. What is this? I don't even understand what this is. Yeah, it's just going to... We'll, we'll continuously skip this nonsense. We'll skip this nonsense, you know? F fuck uh You're right about this how this TV is this talk. is TV. They, they have Gillian Anderson and, uh, uh, what's his name, the, the um, David Duchovny kind of talking about their characters and stuff in this. This is really TV show talk. Just pompous. But you know what? This might have gotten a good response, too, when you talk again about Wizard going in this direction. This is probably one of those things where, like, this is just one random article out of this issue and gets, like, a ton of mail. You I know, mean, something that would indicate to them... Oh, we need to do more of that. It just makes so much sense. It was so hot at the time. They're into season three. Uh, when I when I when X Files was brand new, it had the piece at the beginning that was like you know based on true events or something, and that just fucking blew oh, yeah. my mind so much. Brilliant. But, but then they they took that out of the mixture, and then you just saw what like what it was, and it's just eh, you know I'm, I'm done. My X Files comic story is. Uh, my one of my best friends, Jackson, his daughter was about 13 or 14 and was into X-Files and ended up buying like the big run of X-Files comics for and she loved them. That's so cool. And that was years later. You know, I mean, that would have been like five years ago or something. Polito freaking genius, man. And and. Uh, yeah, but he he Polito Tucci, these guys knew the score and they have some uh, social skills enough to get cozy with the image dudes, I mean, I mean the uh, the Wizard Magazine guys, and get placement of something every issue. So like this is a contest or something. I don't know that these guys would have sold anything without Wizard Magazine, but they were really smart because the early Wizard Magazine it seemed like Marvel and DC were just like, eh, you know, you do you, Wizard, and these other guys like showed up, you know, like they you. I don't know that Wizard goes after Polito if if they get these other people, but instead there's an opening, there's an option. Hey, you weren't the first invitation, but we've got room. And these dudes just took advantage of and, the and, opportunity. And think about what that is. It's not hard to sell people. You you you're churning out a, a monthly magazine with a with a, 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 a ghost staff or whatever you call that band, a skeleton crew, right? And yeah, uh, if, if I can give you the article, I'll do you the favor. Wizard loves it. I'll do you the favor, man. I'll do all the legwork Here's some and art. stuff. Yeah, give, give me a, you know a couple of pages, and boom, you just padded your thing. Another topic that I'd be interested in exploring is the idea of 90s self-publishing. Sure. Because, like, you think of the guys, Dave Sim, the Kevin Eastman, Peter Lairds of the 80s. It totally changes because now you've got Image. You've got guys like like uh, Polito, uh, Billy Tucci, all these dudes. And it's, like, the next version of, like, how do you do this? You saw, like, Quesada and Palmiotti show up because they're like, we can do this. Like, yeah. this is the formula. And it's not just Image. Like, it's a, it's a handful of guys that really sell some comics 
more or less self-publishing them in the 90s. And uh, I never think of them the way I think of like the 80s black and white explosion. But there's a 90s version with cutting edge, you know, tech printing and color and stuff. When I discovered comic shops around this time, basically, and I had a pull list. Uh, a lot of it was informed by Palmer, Tom Palmer Jr. in the, in the pages of uh, Wizard Magazine. I had THB on the pull list. I had Tyrant on the pull list. And ne never got one issue, by the way, uh, of Tyrant in the thing, because like... It, it was all out by, by that point. Uh, Bizarre Heroes. Uh, yeah, there's so many. And and uh, some of those people, man, like I remember Wolf and Bird. I, I never bought that, but like Wolf and Bird and uh, Bizarre Heroes and a couple others, they had this little thing. They called it the Staple Syndicate. And there would be like a little paste up on all their covers that would show the Staple, the staple Syndicate. And it was just a small consortium. It was like the Spirits of Independence kind of deal, I guess, of, of uh, guys, self-publishers who were just maybe uh, so, uh, sharing some distribution or trading ads or something in each other's comics. You know, rising tide raises yeah. all ships type of energy. So there, there was definitely a movement. Um, and it just... It just uh, when, when, you know, it's a distributors. Like, I was going to say, you can almost cut that movement in half where it's like the spirit of independence guys where they're like 50% off if you buy fifty ish, uh, five issues, you know, stuff like that. Like they were talking to these distributors and to the retailers in a way that like the Politos survived that distributor collapse. You know, these, these this other version sort of survived that where they embraced this glossy version of selling like you're a big company. Right. You know, sell the same way Marvel does. Use the same language, the same visuals, the same tools. And, uh, and there's a handful, you know, it's, it's like the 80s version and there's like the 90s version. And it's real interesting that that all takes place. So much was going on in the 90s. Like people just outright dismiss 90s comics. Boy, they miss an exciting decade. Yeah, sure. Exciting. Uh, yeah, sure. And lots of, lots of feces too. Uh, on well, that's that, true anytime. On that anti-gravity room thing, uh, there was a Billy Tucci press conference, like a party. Yeah, the parties were big with these guys. And he was celebrating selling over a million units in the mm. year of like 94. Incredible. Yeah. Man, incredible. From a self-publishing standpoint, like the cut that you're getting out of that is oh, yeah. so much better than, than any other, other way to do it. Uh, Greg Capullo continuing his drawing course, this time monster theme with how this kind of the Halloween issue. Uh, I didn't pull anything from this. It's fun. It's, it's cool to see, but like, you know, it's kind of a fooling around. Tomorrow we'll look at a Greg Capullo drawn, penciled, Todd McFarlane inked spawn issue. And uh, there's so much McFarlane all over it with the noodling. So what we get here is like you're getting a glimpse of of pure Cap Capullo. Still playing with that it same It is very technique. fun to see him doing stuff like this because I don't know that you get this in any of his comics. So it's kind of fun, but, uh, you know, it's not perspective or no, <laughs> human yeah. anatomy or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, the drawing board. Okay. I didn't have too much to take from this. It's an interesting selection of characters. I mean, look at the lack of Marvel DC characters. Is there one? Here's Green Goblin, I think, is your Marvel DC rep. Well, you got Maverick. You always just Maverick. Oh, oh Maverick, yeah. I, was, I always think of that as Jim Lee. I don't think of that as uh, Marvel DC. Homemade Heroes. Look at that thing. Doesn't that look like that should be in that issue of Spawn? That's that U Demon character, right? Uh, Nelson? It's more dare. Oh, yeah. It's U Demon's main foe. Boy, U Demon's one of those books that just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know how that had... Near the traction it got. Yeah. All right. The mystery man himself. Big Del Keown feature. I loved Pitt. I can't tell you much about it. And uh, I'm not sure Del can either. No. I mean, he says flat out whenever he got the invitation to Image, he just whipped up a, a character real fast. I'll tell you this. He redoes his look. Like, we've seen him in the hot artist photo quite a few times, and it looks like a totally different dude. And yeah. I feel like he, he he got some slack from that photo and was like, I'm going to do better this time around. You know, I don't know that that's the case. I think it's like, it's royalty time. Pitt has come out. He might be doing well. He's got that... Go listen to our Dave Cooper shoot interview. Uh, both of these dudes, Dave Cooper and Dale Keown, worked for Barry Blair's Air Cell Comics, and we asked uh, Dave about... Keown, and he, he said, Keown was the first of our friends that was legitimately rich. Uh, the other thing that Dave Cooper said was, he has this big mansion, probably taken there, but the guy had no furniture in there, and and they described this sparsely furnished uh, <laughs> apartment, uh, 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 mansion, and that that's that's young man shit, that's bachelor shit, like, why, like, why do you need to buy a big-ass couch? Like, it's great, because it, it starts out here about, um, you know, he's drawing the adventures of one of Image's most popular heroes. 
during the course of this issue, that changes. Yeah. So we get a sidebar in the last page. Going to Full Bleed Studios. Completely. Yeah, and this traces his whole story, which isn't very long. Air Cell's mentioned, he gets on the Hulk for a couple of years, has a really good run there. Joseph Rubinstein is the guy who yeah. who brought him to the mainstream, which is, which is a fascinating little tidbit. Uh, they uh, have a falling out in the in the process. Uh, Rubenstein's an inker for mm -hmm. for Pitt. Like one of the illuminating things was, of course, you know, you don't think about this stuff uh, until you look at it microscopically in a way. But Del Keon had to assemble his assembly line. You know, he's just a drawer. So he's got writers. Steve Gerber uh, is one of them. He's got all the optics doing color, and he he has inkers. He's just doing the pencil part of the work. And Joseph Rubenstein's one of those guys, and Rubenstein is used to trading pages. And this is an era where you hear about these fucking inkers, like like uh, just making bank, dude. Like like a like a Stephen Platt inker who gets some pages back. He's his rent's taken care of for four months or so, selling that page. It was fascinating to hear about art returns from Rob Liefeld. Yeah. Because in my mind, it's like, oh, here's the policy. You get, you know, 80% or whatever. The, the penciler gets 80% of it. The anchor gets some. The story that he told about, like, some issues didn't even come back. And then, like, how they divided up pages was, there's no could, formula for you that. You could lobby, he said. It's wild. I had, you know, like, in my mind, it's so different than what apparently the reality was. And all of it is some of the my biggest nightmares as a kid, knowing that 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 you were going to have to like send your art off the fact that you might never get it back the fact that like the writer gets some pages how much do we take for granted that like the art never needs to leave our house absolutely it's my art and you're not getting it you're not touching it yeah absolutely. you, you know like wow and, and who knows if you don't go back 30 years to see like how it used to be the birth of Pitt is basically McFarlane twisting his arm to be like, hey, we're all going to go make our own characters and own them and everything. And he just starts trying to figure stuff out and draws a monstrous figure. And he's like, I couldn't get the mouth to work until I took out the nose. Right. Like, Pitt's completely designed the birth of the characters all visual. Totally. Which, man, I love that. You know, at the time, this is one of my favorite image character designs. It's called Image Comics. But man. I love the idea that, like, the visual is what drives the creation of several of those characters. It ain't called Literary Comics Company. This Pit Boss side is about Steve Gerber coming on as writer. At that point, like, I bought all my Pit comics within the last decade. And haven't read them because, you know, pick them up in, in pieces and don't read them through. I had no idea Gerber wrote Pit. Yeah, that... that uh that one dude we kicked it with, Richard Pace, wrote wrote a chunk of those things for uh, Keon. I had no idea Gerber did, but it makes sense, you know. Like, and then and then uh, the the guy who wrote it in the Young Blood issue is like part of the part of the crew also. And then finally, this sidebar, as I mentioned, is that Pitt leaves Image. Go back one just real quick, man. Like, look at how kayfabe that is. He ain't doing nothing with a pencil. On that stuff. Yeah, sign, signing off on some stuff there. He ain't signing nothing. <laughs> it's just like, hey, he posed with something. Getting color proofs, man, of pages. Look at those things. What even are those? They're 11 by 17s. Like, if you see color, people don't work that size. Also, take a look at it. Like, do you recognize it? The, the one that's under his, his hand? Like, that is... That's from Youngblood. That's like where Pitt's inside the uh, subway. Got it. Wrecking those dudes. <laughs> that's that thing that you do as a card like you know it's yeah set the, up a the, nice photo the uh photographer's there grab what's closest and then and then the move of like putting the stuff against the white wall like that's always done just for the photo too look it makes for a good photo no, you know I'm what i mean if you're gonna if you're gonna do it like that looks good it, there's no there's no like this is a cartoonist kayfabe we're giving people the inside scoop on what they're yeah, 100 percent. makes me want it makes me long for like i wish there was some black and white original art of yeah. his in this article that's a bummer clearly calvin yeah with the Del Keon Phil spin. Foglio is doing advertising art here for this game. And who is that? Isn't that uh, Girl Genius, I want to say, is his book? Yeah, I have no idea what that is. He's a cartoonist that went on to self-publish. So a gigantic cosplay section for the Halloween uh, you know, Halloween costume contest. Any standouts uh, for you here? The 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 winners are pretty fucking cool, man. Cause I like, like the Spider-Man that it's just side... T turn the camera. Yeah. That all works for me, even though, like, you look close and it doesn't quite work, but it's such the 60s Batman kind of approach. Totally. But uh, what can you say? It's all dope, you know? Like, it's way better than I can do. I love seeing Mr. Miracle costume. It's so bright. Yeah. 
<laughs> that guy's even funny. He looks more like an alternative comics drawing than he does a human. Yeah, like, like those uh, legs are just him, straight. Him versus Death Ray. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a perfect Death Ray model. <laughs> And then add some lighting there, man, if you really want it to sing. Yeah, yeah, it's just cool, you know. That's a crazy gambit. It's just impossible to get right. Like I think it's pretty good. I can't imagine doing much better for a character that should be way worse than that. G G the way Jim Lee did that hair, it's just like you can't, you can't do it. You can't do it in real life. Oh, man, here we go. Ed, I thought you had read this article before. You you often talk about an Alan Moore, like a big Alan Moore piece in Wizard. Is that a different issue? Uh, I don't know when I talk about that, but like, uh, you know, he he was in other ones yeah. that we already covered for sure. This is fun because this is like more in the thick of the image stuff. Like when he's doing Spawn and Wildcats and Violator and Bad Rock, like some of the weirder shit that he's ever done. Makes me want to go back and track those comics down and read them. Yeah, I got, I, I got them all, like, uh, through... Do through you read any means. Yeah. of them yet? Are they good? <laughs> he talks about it in here, right? Where It's like he has to rethink his entire approach. He knows that he's older. You know what? This is... When we're talking about the Vince McMahon stuff, this is the article that... This is what was on my mind because he is senior in age compared to the, the comics reader. So... Young readers who are my age have far different concerns, and certainly so do the pencilers and stuff. He has to create a uh, a, a space to make stories work in 22 pages at three panels yeah, a page maximum. Yeah, it's so neat to see him lay that out. He wanted to kind of make some of the stuff artist-proof uh, while working in these parameters. But it's the reason, but. In the past, the way he would do that would be with his crazy scripts that were super, super laborious. Uh, he was providing roughs, and, and we've showed some of those off with the uh, Tony Daniel mm -hmm. Spawn vi vampire comic. Uh, it's 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 a fascinating read because it, it touches on the old stuff, but then we talk about the new. And thankfully, so much of everything we're talking about is purely money motivated. Like Dale Keown going to Full Bleed Studios. When there's still some life in in that company, he could make better money, like you said with the Billy Tucci shit, right? Like if he just doesn't have to cut image into anything, you know what I'm saying? So like, Alan Moore admits the money ain't bad here. Listen to a Rob Liefeld shoot interviews, twenty thousand dollars a script, and uh, Alan Moore would deliver two scripts a Friday. This stuff in the beginning, when they talk his background, he talks about being a cartoonist first. Yes. I often wonder how much that helps him as the writer. Oh, sure. You know, like whenever he distinguishes himself from other, you know, comic book writers, Marvel DC writers, I think that's a big chunk because he understands a page, the, the mechanics. Here's the thing, too, man. Like, if you go into the pirate channels, you type Alan Moore's name, I believe it's the one torrent that's like, uh, called like a British invasion or, or or just early works. It's the first it's the first Alan Moore torrent. And it has collections of all his previous like before 2000 AD and any of that stuff from scanned in like hectograph fanzines and it has his strips from Sounds magazine. It was extremely laborious what you would what you would pass off as like underground comics artwork with intense rendering stipple and things one of his things called like Ros roscoe moscow something like that 300 pages yeah it's full work like he's he did a thousand pages of comics i have three volumes of the four maxwell the cats uh, i think it was a weekly strip um maybe daily but uh the guy the guy has over a thousand pages of comics on his own I think that it. Uh, I think that makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think it makes a difference for a writer. Yeah, he thinks visually. You know, and you see it with other other guys too, like the Ed Brubakers and these guys who have, you know, they they did some time yeah. drawing, and I think it translates to their ability to then write the form. They ask him about Swamp Thing, and we associate more with 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 horror. And uh, he said that like the character, it wasn't necessarily like a big choice. You know, they sort of gave it to him. He said if he had his choice, he would do something like Challengers of the Unknown. Yeah, that was fun. But now that he accepted that work, like, he's going to make it his own. And it just made sense to take it that place. And I I think he his career has proven that he's that guy. He's so deeply associated with horror and things. But he has 
you know, the the best Superman comics that were ever made are from Alan Moore's script, and they're not necessarily dark. They're good, tongue-in-cheek superhero comics. His his Supreme is that way. The art is harsh, you know, for the most part, until you get to Chris Sprouse or, or mm -hmm. you know, read the Rick Veach pages or something. But he's very dynamic. We looked at what we called his uh, Forgotten Marvel Masterpiece very recently on the channel, his Captain Britain comics. And he was doing those in tandem with the Miracle Man stuff, Marvel Man stuff, in, in uh, Warrior Magazine. Two different tones. Completely different tones. You know, he is a fantastic writer who... He's, he doesn't just stick to, stick to the formula all the time. A couple of times in here, like when he leaves Swamp Thing, kind of talks about how... He was done. He had kind of gone through his ideas that he had for it, worked them all out, time to move on. And then says it again with the, uh, you know, post-Watchmen, like with superheroes. Whenever you factor in the Captain Britons, the Miracle Mans, the Watchmen's, the Supermen, it's like he had had a chance to explore that part, too, and was kind of done with it at that time. When you it's, read... It's, I, like, I like a creator that does that. Because, I mean, he could have been cashing checks. You see guys write five, six books a month. Uh, you know, he could have been doing that. When we talk Jobber, people get confused because <clears throat> they'll be like, well, you guys did Jobber comics with your Marvel Grand Designs. And it's like, well, nobody told us to do it. We could have said no at any time. We made the thing that we exactly wanted to make. And if it wasn't going to be exactly what we wanted, we would just continue making 100% of the money on our own stuff. Like, it's a no-brainer. Uh, when he was doing Swamp Thing, if you read the run, you could see where he is personally challenging himself. Like when he does, he finishes the horror part, and uh, and Swamp Thing like gets killed by Batman or whatever, and he springs up on the Blue Planet, and then Adam Strange and these like planets of veggie people and stuff. Like he's taking it. He's like, okay, cool. I gave you guys that. Now I'm going to take it into a completely different direction. It's his Richard Bachman shit. Let me see if I can sell something that's completely different. You know, and that's that's. That's a creator, that's a restless creator who is, is trying some things, and he isn't just uh, taking advantage of you. Look at that Watchmen art right there. Every panel, just spectacular. Yeah, they really are. And one of the things that was always crazy, I got that Artisan Edition. We should look at that sometime, man. But uh, it's 11 by 17 paper. And the reason why I bought that one was because all my other Artist Editions were so much bigger. <clears throat> and I was, uh, I work on 11 by 17, and I'm like, let me see a good... 11 by 17 looking fucking comic. Uh, and the fact that he could draw that, like look at the characters, the proportions are all there. Mel makes sense. The faces are built well. And it was drawn microscopically. Yeah, it, it, man, there's a lot of parts in there that worked. And you imagine changing any one of them would have really changed that book. Totally. And, 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 and Dave Gibbons, like he joined us for issue 12 of, of Watchmen. And uh, it was a little bit late. And the possibility of somebody else drawing that last issue, that would have been the routine for mainstream comics. If you can't make the deadline, we get somebody who will. That could have been a possibility, but they let them stick the landing. Says he turned down writing RoboCop films. Yeah, very never, famous. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, very famous. And and, and I, I think it, like Frank Miller got approached immediately, but uh, it must have been in the middle of something. Uh, Verhoeven is like super comic, yeah. dude. Like when you see the proto... Robocop design, it's it's Judge Dredd. This is kind of something. This is a Alan Moore quote whenever McFarlane approached him about Spawn. I've got nothing against writing superheroes as long as it's just a bit of excitement and a bit of fun for teenagers with a few laughs for myself thrown in. Wonder if all his adult fans would take offense to that whenever they're reading his Wildcats and, and uh, you know, taking him very seriously. I hope they ain't taking it that seriously, <laughs> man. See, this is the Jim Lee uh, Gen 13. Uh, this is like the cover to one of them. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it, J. Scott Campbell has something special for that type of comic. And, and this lacks it. You could see he's moving in that direction. Jim Lee, I'm talking about. He's making those eyes bigger than he usually does. Tries doing a little bit of stuff. That feels subliminal. Um, but he just, he, it's, he's not suited for it. That's such a funny one too, because her mouth isn't even open for that yeah. lollipop. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to this. Yeah. <laughs> it's an expensive ad. Boy, they should have spent that money on the, uh, on the art. <laughs> and then, and then, dude, you know, you know that like with those computers of your... Like, this is a three-pager, so that's a big tip oh, file. Be, yeah. To render this, that's that might be the weekend. 
<laughs> like you can't paint this in there. You know, I know it's just like a button, a texture thing, but like even with a powerful computer in 1995, you set it and forget it. And I bet you it crashed two or three times before, before they finally were able to like get the full render out. And I bet you this, the simpleness of like all, all the stuff you're looking at here probably has to be because you're just trying to render that three page brick pattern. This must have never come out, right? This is Malibu Comics. Like, I don't remember. I just any can't part believe we're looking at it still. I, like, I didn't even notice it on my read through, so I was kind of fascinated. By it. <laughs> this is like the end of, of you know the the Ultraverse as well, because Marvel's got them at this point. Yeah, wants to give no royalties to the creators, cut them into no percentages. So buy the comics, buy the properties to just orphan them. So super exciting to read this manga scene installment focused on Adam Warren, who at this point, Dirty Pair was his primary thing did a uh bubblegum crisis miniseries which kind of hard to get nowadays yeah i don't know it and uh yeah four issues but i think it's in color which would have been kind of a different from thing. eclipse you think or dark horse because he did, dark horse maybe because it's later it's after you know i think it's after he had done a bunch of the dirty pair and dirty pair ends up at dark horse so it's probably dark horse sure sure yeah but uh yeah dirty pair was at uh eclipse to, to begin I'd be down for looking at some of that stuff. I have, uh, I think, at least an issue from each of those miniseries. And it's great to trace his story. Because they it mentioned is. being at Kubert School. And after one semester, he was about done. Like, it just wasn't what he wanted to do. And then getting some anime. And that completely sh changes his direction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, to me, like, there's no reason to graduate fr from an art school. Like, if you have any real aspirations to... Uh to make your own way in this world. Uh, it's a space to like in that first year, I only went there one year and I, it was like, show me how to ink with a good brush. Let me just see you do it with good brushes. Let me, let me get good tools. Cause I like my information was minimal at that point. Uh, give me a lot of the sort of hallmark rules that, that have been passed down. And then the next two years, really is just getting bad work out of your system if you're if you're lucky it's just like a space to get bad work out of your system it was a it was a scam to like uh you know you get joe Kubert year three after you invest forty fifty thousand dollars into it and that is just not enough of an incentive for me uh before he went to school though he was very he's a very smart guy uh and excelled in academics and things because he has this like um photographic memory or something ability to memorize and regurgitate the the texts and that made me happy to see in regards to adam warren because i think he is an immaculate drawer i and to know that there's also a brain behind that makes sense to me because he the drawings look smart yeah i wonder if he had to do it over again if he would have created his own characters rather than be um you know, so much like he doesn't own any of that dirty. Yeah, you would stuff. hope, right? Like, like uh, that. The, yeah, that's the one folly, man. Is is like own some stuff, man. Because this, I find these comics really attractive, and nobody was doing this kind of stuff, and and it's certainly not at his level. And he was, he was, he was respected, but so many he like at this time when we started to get a dose of Masamuni Shiro, and Otomo was already out, and like Ninja Scroll came out. It was like, there's fucking badass manga anime out there that isn't that cookie cutter big eye shit. Yeah. And these big eyes were such a turn off. And you, well, I mean, we talked to retailers at, at that summit a month ago who were like, yeah, the big eyes, like, I just can't, I just can't get down with it. Literally the big eyes will turn people off. Like you can look yep. at this whole drawing and look at the masterful figure work, the clean line, uh, how all them is sensual. You know, it's a sexy line that, that he's able to draw there, but it is a turnoff because of those fucking big, what those big guys communicate as uh, an idiom of a form of comics. That's so interesting because the alternative is you get, you know, the generation of like Brandon Grahams who are probably coming to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a signal to a certain group. It's a signal it's a, to, it's to a smaller group. groups and some has come here and some is like, I don't want any part of that. Yeah. And it's a smaller group, <clears throat> by the way. Who, who... Tezuka's Adolf uh, called out here in Picks of the Month. Yeah. Great book. Two books. All right. Palmer's Picks. Usually my highlight every issue. This one covering uh, Strange Attractors. 
You, I did not check my boxes to see if I may have an issue or two of this, but it's not something that I ever think of. Like this is not a series I know. I do have I do have some. Uh, there, there was no reason to to scoop it up. Uh, there was no reason to scoop it up. Um, it's not it's not so great. You can find it in the quarter bins very easy. Uh, I'm sure like God Damn Log and Power Comics and stuff I have might have shown off a, a couple of issues. But uh, Tom Palmer, listen if you if you if you hit hit the baseball 50% of the time, you're going to the Hall of Fame. You know what I mean? Like, uh, Tom Palmer has a much better batting average. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, he redeems does, himself he in does the, recommended, have a the recommended reading here. Love this collection, right? Eight Ball, Dan Klaus, sure. Even highlights, he's doing those short stories like Care Catcher. Uh, you know, so it's kind of interesting that we've entered the second phase of Eight Ball and that gets caught out. 32 Stories, the collection of Adrian Tomini's Optic Nerve. I have that collection. Uh, great stuff. Tug and Buster. <laughs> I'll be honest. I have a soft spot for like the Mark Hempel cartooning. I think it's really sharp. Yeah. But it's so different than the eight ball 32 stories kind of uh, preceding choices. This page with these recommendations and, and, and the recommendations of the, the author. Like like sometimes these recommendations are from, from uh, the, the yeah. guy who did the book. Um, that's when I talk about the Trinity, man. The eight ball, the hate the uh, Acme Novelty mm -hmm. Library. You see it often. It would be here, and it would be in that very final page yep. uh, where people are talking about, like, what are you reading? And when you start to see it enough, Acme Novelty, 8-Ball, it's like, I have to go fucking check those comics out. I like this drawing. I will look at one of these next time I come across it in the uh, in the 50-cent bin. Uh, this is movie stuff. I don't really care too much about it. It's surprising that this guy is so involved. And I was looking at his name... Does this dude, is he part of the group that ends up buying Kitchen Sink? Remember when Kitchen Sink gets into some weird, like, L.A. investors? I, I don't know. I wonder if he's connected to that. I did not look it up, um, but something there. Wesley Snipes mentioning Blade here at the end. One of the uh, unsung, I think, comic book movie hits. One, well, yeah, one of the ones that really, like, changed the game for sure. Yeah, it was that formula of, like, oh, we can take a B-list character and make a movie that's successful. Uh, top ten comics... This stuff doesn't change much from month to month. X-Files on here, a lot of the bad girl stuff. Gen 13. Nothing too much there. Ash, number one, makes an appearance. The Joe Quesada, Jimmy Palmiotti are uh, self-publishing. There's a lot of extreme studios ads in this issue. Yeah, for sure. Um, Comic Watch. Meh. Bill Sienkiewicz inking Sabusima is a pretty fun run. <laughs> this is not their famous run, though. There, there's an earlier one where uh, those two... Uh, pair up i i laugh because at this at this time period man i used to fuck off in my english class so bad and then like the teacher like call my parents like like the, all that stuff man like i was just such a nuisance and the way that he found to buy my silence was to grab a stack of comics and get, he would hook me up every friday if i was just chilled out and not being an asshole and it was like the salby sema Vilsakevich run was a part of the pile. Like the ones that I have from this this run, are because Mr. Pesota was his name uh, was was uh, bribing me to behave myself. This was um, I feel like this was a jump the ship moment for Marvel. One of, one of probably several. Stuff, yeah. But ah oh, man, I didn't read any of that stuff or keep up with it. But I remember it just felt like there was a horrible negative backlash to that. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was uh, it was really abusing the reader because of like prolonging it over across a it bunch felt like of titles. Russo kind of writing. It was the prolonging it over a long, long time and just not each section yeah. was not satisfying. Like I feel like you can make something like that work pretty easy, but you have to stick with the tenets of like the unit. Like what is the unit? Dan Jargon's bringing his Superman magic to the house of ideas here. Yes. And you know what? His, that shit looked good. Klaus Jansen, I like this image. Klaus Jansen inking him is nice. I, I wonder about the colorist because I love this double lighting, but it looks like it should be double lit all over. Wish they would have pushed that a little bit further. Yeah. Sin City Silent Night, we've covered this issue, and, uh, I, you know, that was a big comic for me as a kid when it came out. Totally. Cerebus 200. Talk about a uh, time frame. Any of the picks pop up? No, not, not too much. Yeah, it really feels like this is a dry <laughs> period for, like, anything of, of uh, new. You know, there just isn't a lot of, like, new. Yeah, this is a, so, what a mad. So, <laughs> we, you see this in comics to this day. Like, I was at 
a big convention, I will say, because I just don't want to, I don't know these people, you know. They had what I would guess would be at least $10,000 of infrastructure to like make their booth. It was castle walls. It was higher than everything else on the floor. It was probably more than 10000 I, I think it was maybe fifty. I Because it, it was like a house. That's just expensive. It was gigantic. And it's one of a kind. You know, mm-hmm. you have somebody... Mm. Like, to get cabinets put in, in your kitchen is twenty grand. Yeah. And that's one of a kind and custom and stuff. So, like, it was a gigantic expense. It was on the West Coast, glitter town-ish type area. Hawking a fucking shit comic like this. So, this cracks me up because this is just some Joey Jerkoff stuff, whatever it is. Uh, it's a shit comic, but I promise you that the people behind it, because I've seen it my whole life, have so much money. Nepo baby, super rich doctor, surgeon, dad. I, like, I went to school, like at Kubert school, there was this, there was this small motherfucker, man, who would have overdraft fees. The overdraft fees on the card that he was given by his mama the overdraft fees were double what I had to spend for my whole monthly budget. You know what I'm saying? And so that this reeks of that to me, <laughs> where it's so raw, and it's, um, you see it to this day. We know so many of these people, too, man, who, like, you know, come up to us and shit, and they're looking for the cheat code. The cheat, like, they, they, they don't want to take the time and make a great comic. They're looking for the easy way to, like, promote it and stuff. This is, like... Uh, Peter Laird said in a shoot interview, uh, worth a quarter maybe. It's not worth the cover price of what this comic is. And like, rather than hone the craft, get better, you put out a super crap comic, and then you get your mom to foot what five thousand dollars for an ad in 1995. Ten, you know, it's in the interior. It's not an inside cover. It's not a back cover. So it's a little less. But what are some of the other ads? Yeah, video <laughs> games that cost fifty bucks a piece. Rob Liefeld, who's happy to do Lost Leaders to, to you know, to sell his bibliography of uh, his catalog of stuff. I don't recognize this, but it, it does make me wonder if I've seen it, you know, in the, uh, in, in, the, in the dollar bins. Because what else would it be? Exactly. But this just, it spoke to me so deeply because it's, it's somebody trying to find the cheat code for success without doing the hard work. You mentioned going to Qbert school with an eye of like, learn the right tools, yeah. learn how to use a brush and stuff. And that's the other thing that this has is like, none of those standard tools are on display there. This is, this is, does feel like, like if I would see this, I would guess it was like 87. Totally, totally. And, and you know, these guys come out of the woodwork whenever stuff is high. Yeah. Yeah. But there might even be one more ad for some shit comic like that. I hope here. there is. <laughs> And this might be it. Whatever this is. I have this. This is real. The The Three-Breasted Woman sci-fi book is real. But this is an audio CD. Oh. <laughs> Computer not required. Why would you do quotes around not? <laughs> <laughs> Look at the graphic design choice there. Yeah. Sleaze that. Skew the head. Bizarre. He gets a, gives a hate the first shout out. Makes him laugh out Tell loud. Tell me, man. Straight bullets. All right, here we go. This is what this issue is. My favorite part of this issue. Statement of Ownership, Management, and Circulation. 460,000 copies of this was the press run, this issue. Of that 460,000, 334,000 distributed. Returns from the news agents, 121,000. So they were selling a lot on on newsstands and Ed, you're not being able to find one. It's because they sent 120,000 copies back. <laughs> Those numbers are nuts. And that is 25% of the print run that they don't get paid for. Right. Yeah, totally. So like, so like maybe with this issue, cause like this is, this is data from the past. Like maybe with this. Oh, issue, you know what? This is nearest issue to filing. Yeah. This is not this issue. Yeah, right, no, right of that. course. Yeah. You can't, it's impossible. <clears throat> like, but you could see like, if you did an issue, you know, like their average over the last year is 109,000 returns. If you did an issue, like, let's say this one and 50,000 come back, dude, you're having emergency meetings. Like we did right. something we got to repeat. And I'm Cause saying, I mean, that's, that would be 50,000 copies of books that you'd be getting paid for. Right. And, and I, uh, I'm telling you, like, I, you know, I went to the various grocery stores with mama and, and 
and Kmart and stuff like that during that month. You could not find this issue anywhere. Uh, the one piece that's not in here, unless it's like the language of it is a little bit different. I guess that's like uh, paid circulation. Like uh, subscribers. I'm, I'm curious about that. Is this just like 30,000 number? Yeah, that's exactly what that is. Paid or requested circulation mailed. So 35,000 subscribers. That's right. That can probably, that, that's enough to float your whole enterprise probably. Yeah, that was, that was the great, like that was before the direct market because you're probably even making a little bit more off of those. Sure. You know, you're paying shipping, but you're also getting like that money you're all in kind of bulk. Get, yeah. you, can, you can also dump, you know, 11 issues worth into your, uh, whatever investment you're making and, and collect interest on that too, before you even send those issues out. Yeah. It's uh, I love these numbers. Like, you know, I reprinted the entire history of the Incredible Hulk is in that Hulk grand design because I find these numbers so interesting. Yeah. I was thrilled to see that when I was flipping through here. Uh, card stuff, I got nothing for that. Always look at these um, hot artists and, and writers, and I was thinking, we got an inker in the number one slot. Totally. That's got to be every inker's hero is this uh, this issue, man, the hottest artist. And I have zero against Billy Tucci, but him in the second spot and like she and all the high numbers, I'm telling you, he knows how to give the proper fruit baskets and stuff to Garab. Like, we need to have that shoot interview and be and just be like, Billy, what was it? Like, be honest with us and tell us how you gamed that system, dude. Because you're coming out of nowhere. Like, we've done every issue of Wizard up to this point. We did episodes. And uh, we made note whenever the first she shows up. And it comes out of nowhere, but they immediately say it's a hot book. He builds such a relationship. There's articles... Articles abound, contests abound. It's always in the top spot. You're getting the number two spot over all of these tried and true yeah, that's dudes. That's incredible. So, like, there's a shenanigans that's happened. And that's fine. Like, game the system. If, if, if I was operating in this, like, at this time, I, I would be in a top five. I know I would, man, because I would know what what to do. But I'm just curious how he handled that for himself, man the uh the turtles at a down point in the uh, turtle history here being called a loser number nine artist mark silvestri for witchblade did he ever draw witchblade i don't know anything about that stuff the writer's stuff is really out there like i i feel like they just threw names in a hat and drew and pulled them out it's 90 uh it's 95 they're just jim lee not, number nine hottest writer they're just they're not that feels like it was the wrong hat <laughs> i don't know that he's even credited as writer on those issues yeah i'm sure brandon Choi, the luckiest man in comics comes with them bizarre thb a little uh little pull out pop here back issues are apparently uh selling a little markup 10 bucks for uh issue one that's true. Top 100. X-Men is number one spot. Spawn 37 at number two. Like, Spawn was such a... Boy, he sold a lot of books for the first several years. Yeah. And if you look in that Key Collector app, it has the print runs of, like, the more recent stuff. Whenever there's not a nickel and dime anniversary or yeah. he's gaming the system, it'll be 2,000 copies a, uh, a month. It'll be 3,000 copies a month uh, at times. Of Spawn? Yeah. 3,000 copies? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, Not 30,000. Correct. It gets low. It gets very low. And and that's that's why they call it out, because they're calling it rare, you know? Wow. That's uh, that's shocking to me. The only other image book listed in the top 10 here is Gen 13, number 6. So Gen 13 was a, was a bigger hit than I realized. Oh, I knew yeah. it was popular, but that's significant. There's a bad girl that she's coming up. All right, price guide. I don't have anything to pull from there. We looked at that Todd Ego column. Yeah, pretty much the last page. Here are those CDs. It's like 20 bucks to get um, screen screensavers. 20 bucks. Comic Anthology, though. So it's it's the uh, Eric uh, Larson library of image comics on, on CD-ROM. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, I didn't see that. Man, that fidelity must have been very low. Those old computers, they were usable, and they had graphics and color, but it was pretty... Stuff that got us through this issue, Mark Wade and Ron Garney doing their Captain America run, which is going to be a little controversial when they do that Heroes Reborn that they uh, pull them off of there. Yep. It's a little footnote mention of that, gaining some uh, some fandom. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll cover that as it comes up. Yes. And uh, Wizard Profile, Bernie Wrightson. 
and I don't have a lot to take out of this. Love Wrightson, kind of cool, gives his background a little bit. Showed showed off his portfolio to a couple of pros at a convention, and they're like, if you were in New York, you'd work in comics. Loaded up the U-Haul, moved to New York. Yeah. <laughs> Love I, that. I think I think uh, Bob Beerbaum like, has photos, and he was talking about seeing like a young... Bernie Wrightson carrying a portfolio around talking to like Frazetta or like Roy Crankle or somebody at a, at a festival. This was, uh, this is my last spawn, spawn toys. Like I had this one, I had Dutch because of the chap yap love. And there was a variant of Wetworks figure that was like a translucent blue. I think he was called like assassin something. And I, that I had, and that was like the final spawn toys that I got. And see, I still call him, uh, I think he was called Anti Spawn. Yeah, I think that's to start, true. and then that's like the first time that you see him called Redeemer, as a, as like the figure. Because I'm like, no, that's Anti Spawn. And then the atrocious Spawn video game. Atrocious. Terrible. You know, like the the, a lot, the way a lot of these games work uh, is that uh, they have this. They they build a game. And you could just sell more copies if you plug a character into it. So there's nothing Spawn-like about it. You could have plugged any kind of like hero-ish character. Uh, in these old games also, um, the power... like I guess it would make sense for a Spawn because he has the power meter. But that was like the part that would always break these games. Because like Superman can't always be Superman. You know? You, 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 so, so there's like a power meter. Well, Wolverine can't just... Pull his, if he pulls his claws out, his mutant power goes away. It's pretty weak. Hell of an ad. I bet you this this game must have sold a bunch of copies. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, uh, the movie is out or coming out soon. Sp Spawn was so gigantic in the 90s, and we're, we barely crested. He's still just doing comic books, uh, uh, toys and things. But when he is at the top of his game, there is an aisle at Toys R Us that is fully dedicated two McFarland toys, and it's both sides. Uh, you know, so like, you walk through the aisle, the left will be just all of the McFarland stuff, and then the right will be like, here's the Akira toys, the Austin Powers toys, the Hanson brothers from Slapshot, fucking Freddy Krueger and Jason. It's astonishing the, the lines that he's done. So, Where the Wild Things are movie characters. I remember yeah. looking it up when we interviewed him, and I was shocked. So much kiss uh, Psycho Circus. I, I feel like he made Kiss cool again. Crazy shit. Yeah, so he's not even there. Like, he pivots. He becomes the toy guy. Big time. Well, what an, what an there's issue, uh, closing out 1995. <laughs> this is what shit looks like in the comics world, at least according to Wizard Magazine. You know, this would be one if we if we have it. The uh, I'd be curious about like the end of 1995 comics journal issue mm -hmm. as a uh, point of contrast. Right. And I don't know if they did wrap up issues back then. Like I would get those kind of in the late nineties and two thousands, but they probably had something. I'd be curious to kind of look through there and see what their 1995 looked like. For sure, man. Yeah. The way, way they, they, they really give the numbers in, in, in the journal. It's all dire in the journal. Yes. Good to go. I am. Okay. Favors like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Hit the Patreon, support the channel, and uh, it mitigates the kayfabe effect. Uh, when we talk about comics on the channel, the books disappear on the aftermarket. But if you're a king kayfaber, you're, you have the ability to watch us record these videos. And uh, you get all the videos before anybody else. But the vids are brought to you by the books that we make. So, Jimmy, tell the people what's out there. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. This is your instructions at home. Pre-order this one wherever you buy comics. It collects all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Deadly Squirrel Live. Add that to your shelf if you don't already have it. My other books include Hulk Grand Design and The Plain Janes. And I am now serializing my next comic on my Patreon. You can read that at patreon.com slash jimrug. Okay, man. If you're watching this video when it comes out, tomorrow is the final order to cut off for Red Room Crypto Killers issue number one. And that means if you want one of these special covers, you got to talk to your store and you got to order accordingly. You could get the sketch cover uh, for yourself, no problem. But if you want that Jimmy... Uh, cover by way of Rob Liefeld, the peach cover. If you want my incentive variant cover, got to talk to your shop about that, man. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. It's going to start coming out on a monthly basis. Uh, so scoop those comics up. There are two Red Room trade paperbacks out there right now. And my big book of 2023 is going to be the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. 
this is going to be all gold foil in the back. Like once we get that thing printed up, it's going to be real sexy. Uh, it collects all four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree with 140 pages of additional artwork and con content that uh, is not in the first four volumes. Uh, go to your local comic shop, put in the word that you want that thing when it comes out. That's my big book of 2023, and I hope you support it. Two, uh, two volumes, like I said, of uh, Red Rumor out there in trade paperback form. Four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree. Three volumes of X-Men Grand Design. And WYSIWYG is out there, man. But Jimmy, tell the people how else they can uh, help out the channel. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, coffee mugs, stickers, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. All great ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give them those marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.